And very often data can tease that out. We can learn how important price is to the customer, how important delivery time is to the customer, how many, you know, I think a big part of any marketplace is understanding that balance of supply and demand and how to yes. not just like forecast it, but also act against it. Peter Fishman, thank you so much for joining me on 20 Minute Leaders. How are you today? Doing well. Calling from California? I'm in San Francisco. San Francisco. Lots to cover. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, fascinating, fascinating journey. Uh, I don't know how many more people I've had in this show that have, have so many different experiences uh, as you've had. Uh, I, I even have to open it up next to me in order to read it, which I have, I don't think I've ever had to do that before. All the way starting from studying economics at, uh, at London School of Economics to doing your bachelor also at Duke, University of California, Berkeley, doing your PhD. Uh, and then you're moving to Narrow Economic Consulting, Google, uh, Philadelphia Eagles, the Pantheon Group, uh, Playdome, Econ economist in Walt Disney, director of analytics at Yammer, principal data science manager at Microsoft, VP of analytics and growth at Zenefit, an amazing company, uh, head of analytics at Open Door, uh, chief bacon officer at Bacon Hot Sauce. You'll have to explain to me what that is. And most recently, uh, your chief strategy officer of Ease, a company that a lot of our friends in California will know what it's about, and you'll explain to us soon. And now the co-founder of your own company, Mozart Data. Did I get any of that right, or am I completely off? <laughs> uh, it's a nice walk down memory lane. But uh, yeah, I spanned a lot of different companies and a lot of different uh, careers with some common themes there. I need about 19 minutes of breather after reading that list. Peter, what the hell? How... <laughs> How does a person go through a, a list like this? How does that happen? Yeah, well, so I think you hit on, on one thing. I'm an economist by trade. So I did my PhD uh, in economics uh, in the Bay, about eight miles east of where I'm currently living uh, at UC Berkeley. It was uh, a really special time to be in behavioral economics and applied behavioral economics. Um, and I was working with a lot of data. Uh, and uh, and sort of getting that training and sort of teasing causality uh, out of a data set and trying to understand what's driving uh, certain things that are happening simultaneously is a really interesting tool set that uh, I learned in graduate school. And then uh, there, was, there was sort of this really nice movement towards using more and more and more data as it became more ubiquitous in in tooling and decision making, and then more and more cost effective, so that organizations beyond just the giant tech companies could really use uh, data to advance their decision making. And that's kind of um, been a common thread uh, of my career. Right. I mean, you can you can literally see the thread as you're transitioning from being an economist and an analyst at these companies to then running the analytics and growth, but then transitioning into strategy and data science, right? And then most most recently, the company that you're running now, Mozart Data, which we'll talk about soon, is really help, helping companies analyze the data, pretty much the work that you've been doing across about a dozen of these fantastic organizations. But Peter, before before we get to Mozart Data, I'll leave that for the second half. I, I'd love to pick your brain on these nuggets and experiences from these different companies. As an economist, what is the role of an economist within these tech organizations. And when I look at also Walt Disney, I think of it as a technology company like any other. Yeah. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, larger companies have economists that opine on the direction of the economy because so much of the investment of people and resources depends on like basically the bigger macroeconomic picture. Um, that's actually not at all what I do. Um, I, an economist in my mind is about <laughs> using an economic uh, tool set to understand uh, data. So thinking about uh, kind of some of that training and some of that sort of micro economic decision-making and how that impacts the sort of macro 
uh, vision of a company. So I think a lot of um, what I do, though my title is often economist and though my training is often economist, I'm uh, just an applied statistician that happens to have taken some economics classes. So I wow. think with that, yeah, so I think there's the, the, the common theme there is that economists have a, a really good way in my mind of thinking about causality and prediction. A lot of, of modeling like an, data, right? It's right. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of thinking about kind of the relationship between two things that are happening. Um, and, and that's because um, data used to be a lot smaller. So when I did my PhD, I had a giant, 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 giant data set, which was about half a million observations. Um, today, wow. if we saw a data set of half a million observations, um, it would, um, you know, it, it would be, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, events that people you know, might have picked up in minutes or even less. So um, what used to sort of count as a giant data set was, was, uh, you know, is now a, a very, very, very trivial data set. And, but, you know, because data was small, you had to think of really clever ways of understanding the world and understanding relationships in the data. And sometimes that meant things like, um, you know, describing um, a mechanism, a behavior that would sort of account for these two things co-varying with each other. And sometimes that would be actually sort of these fake experiments that would be existing in the data. They weren't real experiments. They weren't like scientific method experiments where you try condition A and condition B and see which one's the winner, which is you know so prevalent in today's A-B testing and other forms of testing, but rather um, things that were sort of almost a natural experiment that would occur in the data and you'd have small data and you'd want to tease out that causal relationship and think about it in a deep way about in what ways is this not a real experiment? So, um, so that training, I think, really helped as we transitioned uh, at smaller tech companies from essentially small data to almost everybody having uh, big data due to a lot of cost efficiencies that have come up on the data side. That transition from an economist or an analyst to running analytics, to being head of analytics, head of growth, both at uh, Zenefits and then at Open Door. What is that? How, how is that transition? What is, what is the thinking process? Because to me, it sounds like it, it's a little bit even more dramatic than being an engineer to, to a head of engineering. Here you're, you're really, because like you're saying like economists, it's the thinking of, of causality and, and what impacts what and, and modeling data to see trends. And in one hand, you're modeling, you know, a subset of the data as in your position. And it sounds to me like, you know, being head of analytics is now thinking much more broadly about, okay, where are we headed? What can we extrapolate from the data? And what can we request from the engineering to provide us for the future? Yeah. yeah. So in my first year of graduate school, I read uh, Moneyball, which was okay. for many, for many folks in the analytics industry, that was a very sort of uh, defining book. It's Michael Lewis's book on the Oakland A's. And I was going to graduate school, just one town north of Oakland. And, um, and, and then ultimately, I became sort of the money baller uh, at the Philadelphia Eagles, which is I used my graduate training to, you know, pull out sort of insights about players and football activity. I love uh, that. At, at the Eagles. Um, and um, what I learned there was really about impact across an organization, which is very often, you know, there can be an insight, like it's good to go for two when you're down by 14, or, uh, or it's good to trade out of the first round or something that the data clearly, or it's good to go for it on fourth and short, whatever it is, the data might back that out and might be convincing in an academic way, but there's real people. Um, and you don't get to really run all the experiments you want in the real world. And sort of having a big impact across an organization is not just about teasing out the insights and the data, but it's also about kind of driving impact within the organization. Now you Making had mentioned, it happen, right. Exactly. So you had mentioned a few transitions, right? I transitioned from being an individual contributor at you know, a company like Platinum and Disney to being a, you know, sort of a junior leader uh, to being a more senior leader. And all of those have different steps, different sort of stakeholders across the organization. And you do kind of, like you said, for, for many engineers, they transition from being a great engineer to now having a role of managing engineers. And there's just such a different sort of almost skill set. Um, 
And the same is true, of course, in, in data and analytics, which is to say there's a certain skill set which involves being able to wrangle a bunch of data, being able to clean or tease insights out of data or communicate with data. I think actually, I, I would actually probably have the opposite uh, because, because with when you're an analytics leader, you're trying to tease those same insights out of the data and simplify it at the sort of cross-functional level. So a lot of those core skills you develop as an IC, though the jobs aren't identical, a lot of those sort of core skills translate really nicely into the Interesting. world. Interesting. What do you enjoy more? Which of uh, these? Well, you know, obviously I've spent the last sort of decade of my career um, leading data teams of different sizes. You know, I've jo I joined Zenefits where I led the data team of just me. Um, and then ultimately grew it to a very large team as that company had a really meteoric uh, scale up. Um, yeah. And then, you know, obviously, uh, most recently before Mozart Data, I worked at a company, Ease. Um, Ease is basically a cannabis marketplace that matches supply and demand. It matches uh, sort of dispensaries with consumers that want those products. Um, like and... any regular marketplace, except for it, it's it's yeah. because it you you just give the definition of what a marketplace does, and it seems so common that you know we have a marketplace for everything, for beverages, for food, for toys, for whatever. Uh, obviously, when it comes to cannabis, and it's still a fresh thing in 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 many states, it's still something that that requires explanation. But but I'm sure it was a phenomenal experience, and I've actually been following the activity of Ease, and, and I love the way that they're democratizing and regulating the, the whole transaction and the marketplace. But but please continue. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think actually data plays a big big role there. Um, you know, I think when you think about uh, a, a very highly regulated market, um, some of the challenges become actually addressing that regulation, but doing so really quickly and understanding what really matters to your customer. Right. And very often data can tease that out. We can learn how important price is to the customer, how important delivery time is to the customer, how many, you know, I think a big part of any marketplace is understanding that balance of supply and demand and how to yes. not just like forecast it, but also act against it. So um, data plays a huge role in what uh, Ease does, and it was a really forward-thinking uh, investment to, you know, build out a, a strong data capability because that was, you know, and you know, on, on some sense, it's forward-thinking. On the other, on the other hand, it's just us catching up to other industries. You know, you mentioned sort of, uh, you know, food delivery, right? Looking, you know, like many of these as solve problems. Transportation, obviously, the matching of supply and demand that Uber and Lyft do. These are all very solve problems in those industries, and kind of, and what a key role data plays at those places. Just being able to map that to, you know, a place with a ton of regulatory challenges. You know, this is uh, cannabis. I think is uh, has been and will continue to be a really interesting um, data and managerial problem for for a while. No, it's it's pretty inspiring to me that a company like like Ease goes in and takes an economist and somebody that that runs that heads analytics and data science teams. Uh, and puts in the position of a chief strategy officer because it really it is saying something it's saying that we believe that our core strategy should be guided by the by, by data and by mm -hmm. by you know the causality and by a team that knows how to manage this data and run the analytics i don't think that most companies have necessarily that persona as the chief strategy officer yeah. i might be wrong but i haven't seen that that often so i agree with you but i think the trend is that so when you think about sort of marketing, you've, you've traditionally seen a lot of CMOs, but you start to see uh, growth leaders. Now, growth tends to be just quantitative marketing, right? Right. Now, similarly on the operations side, when you think about solving a problem like how much demand do we expect to have in, say, San Francisco on a Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m.? Ultimately, this is a data problem, but it's also a people problem. You have to have the right number of people sort of there to, you know, essentially connect the supply and demand. So on the one hand, to me, that kind of strategy work is ultimately just data problems, but you can see operations, you know, business operations and uh, operations just looking more and more like data problems and having more and more savvy 
data leaders come into leadership roles in those functions, as well as the expectation for anybody that's a COO, that's a VP of operations, is that they're comfortable working certainly in a BI tool, but also having a good grasp of data and what's, what's happening with their data. And I think that's a perfect way into uh, what Mozart data does. So having that grasp, having that handle on, on all this different data and what you can do, uh, talking a little bit about what Mozart data does, and I'm particularly interested to hear really tangibly what, what insights you've gained from you know, the, these years of both being the data handler and the data manager, transitioning into your, your new baby and uh, Mozart data. Yeah, thanks. And it's actually, like you said, a very relevant uh, segue because um, what Dan, my co-founder and I saw was that there was this growing population of folks that were really uh, competent and comfortable and itching to use the data. Like this population of business analysts, sales ops, marketing ops, business ops, heads of analytics, data analysts that really knew what they wanted from their data, had a great understanding of the business definitions and understanding of what data would inform those business decisions. But getting at that data, which is now getting more and more siloed by all the different sort of uh, bevy of tools that people are using, people are using all these different SaaS tools and databases that all basically silo that data that it's producing. So there's this sort of imbalance where the demand for data is growing really rapidly and the supply, we know where it is, but it's hard to get at. You typically have to hire engineers or data engineers to essentially enable that centralization of data. And this was becoming a problem at more and more companies and they hire folks like me or like Dan to actually go uh, centralize that data so that it can be used across the organization. And a lot of that centralizing work is in my mind, um, sort of wrote or commoditized. And, you know, we would just go from company to company, you know, all the ones that you mentioned in my career, building out either, you know, the same stack or something very, very similar, sort of centralizing everything in a powerful data warehouse, a columnar data warehouse. And we decided to essentially build that as a service so that really anybody that's really comfortable with data and data thinking and SQL could really do the data cleaning and the extracting, loading, and transforming of the data that needs to be done um, with their skill set, you know, with their understanding of the business definitions, with their understanding of their technologies, and not needing, you know, Python, Jinja, DAGs, custom languages to really make all of the work that is actually quite straightforward, what data you need. Uh, making that available without kind of a big data engineering lift. So what we try to do is be the easiest way to onboard sort of a modern data stack. That's it. That's so interesting. So would, would, it, would an interesting workflow be that let's say that there's somebody in marketing that has a ton of data and CSVs that they get mm -hmm. from somewhere within mm -hmm. their company. They load that data to you. You help automatically cleaning it and starting to, to, to see some causality and, and some models on it and then provide, with, provide them a framework for analyzing the data without having to use things like, like code uh, yeah. or data science. Well, so I want to back it up one step. So, you know, you, you've already gotten to a point where the marketer has that data in CSV form. Um, I want the marketer to be using the tools that they're comfortable in. Maybe that's you know, HubSpot, or maybe they're using Salesforce, or maybe they're using Google wow. ads or Facebook ads. And we want to be able for them with just the credentials, just the rights to be able to use that data, to be able to extract and load that into a central data warehouse. Now, they might also have CSVs or G sheets or something like that, which they also want to put in their data warehouse. They want to combine and clean this all and transform it all uh, in, you know, in their data warehouse. And they can do that uh, with a platform like Mozart. Now, going all the way to the end, we are actually not in the BI space. So we don't, um, you know, give you the tooling to go, you know, graphically represent your data and tell a story with your data, which is like I mentioned, you know, from my time, you know, with the Eagles and then throughout my career, a really important part of what a great data person does. They tell a story with the answer. And um, that's not really what we provide, though we actually really like giving um, customers a good push in the back in terms of these are core tables. These are core pieces of analyses that like we see uh, a lot of folks in the space that you're in doing. So we like to give people frameworks for um, 
for doing the cleaning, for building their analysis. But really what we want to do is empower you to get to that point of a central warehouse um, where you can start joining data from different tools. And we want to really make that uh, available to anyone. I love that. Peter, before we go, I have to thank you uh, for being generous with your time and for joining me in this show. I have two last questions that I have Great. to ask. First of all, Chief Bacon Officer of Bacon Hot Sauce. Now yes. you've been there for 10 years, so I'm yes. guessing this is gonna, it's a little different from the rest. Yeah, so, uh, so Bacon Hot Sauce was a real passion project. Um, so actually Dan, the co-founder of Mozart and I uh, started this hot sauce company uh, 10 years ago. Um, we had the idea that the two best things in the world were bacon and hot sauce and we had to combine them. And then we made that a reality uh, and then ran that business uh, for 10 years. And actually, uh, we ended up selling the business uh, and uh, starting Mozart. So, so, you know, there's like sort of like a, a, a lie, which is to say, like, you know, there's a story about Slack, which is they were, you know, a tiny spec. And then suddenly, they, you know, that wasn't going where they wanted it to go. So they decided to pivot into their chat app. You know, we sort of tell the story, it's only partially true, which is we had a hot sauce company that was failing and that we needed to pivot. So we pivoted into this uh, Mozart data company, which, which is true insofar as that it's Dan and I working on it uh, together, but we're sort of uh, data people at our core, but also bacon and hot sauce people also at our core. Uh, Peter, I have to say that I feel like I, I've wasted uh, 20 minutes here because I want to go back and just talk about this, this bacon hot sauce company, uh, but we'll leave that for another episode uh, in another cycle. Before we leave, Peter, I need three words that you would use to describe yourself. Sure. So uh, number one is like efficient. So I love, uh, I love when people are able uh, to make uh, great 80-20 uh, like trade-offs um, because yes. so much of kind of the insight, I think comes in kind of just uh, the setup and understanding of it. Um, I guess uh, another one that I, I, I sort of, uh, you know, as a, as a single word, it's, it's sort of like a pay it forward, but I think one of the- There's things, hyphens in there. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, pay it forward is what I found in the Valley is that so much of my growth can be attributed to folks that I've worked with both that were above me, uh, that worked for me and that were actually, um, I guess, horizontal to me. So um, I think when you invest in, in having those people understand uh, either data or how you're thinking about the data or how you're thinking about the problem, um, that pays uh, huge dividends. And then last year, we have um, a big mentality around growth, uh, uh, you know, at Mozart, uh, professional growth, uh, you know, personal growth, all of those things. And I think uh, growth, you know, obviously my career at parts was working in sort of growth marketing, but um, I think growth is also another one that's a little bit counterintuitive, which is the more someone grows, it doesn't distract them from the core of what they're doing. It actually, there's no substitution. It actually just adds more and more and more richness uh, to their capabilities and also their, their willingness to invest in something. So sort of growth ties nicely with pay it forward. Peter. Thank you very much. This was wonderful. Congratulations on Thank your you. recent uh, $4 million seed round for Mozart Thank Data. Uh, I told you right before that I'm, that I'm already upset that we did this a couple of weeks too late because I wish uh, we could have gotten in there. Uh, but, uh, but really, congratulations. And, and I, love, I love your take on things. And, and particularly, I get inspired by people's journeys where, where they, become, they, they, they experience these growing pains over, over, over lots of experience, over shared experiences, eventually culminating in, in this aha moment that they have internally and then bring it out to the world. So thank you for the inspiration for that. And stay safe and stay healthy. Same to you. Enjoyed it.